Hi, my name is Amanda Kiefer, and I'm the Communications Associate for the Cardinal Institute for West Virginia Policy. And today we have with us Dr. Ed Timmons from the Nee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at St. Francis University. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Amanda. It's great to be with you. Today we're here to talk with Dr. Timmons about our most recent study published with our Executive Director Garrett Ballinger and Dr. Timmons and his research team. Um, regarding occupational licensing in West Virginia and our two neighboring states, Ohio and Pennsylvania. But before we dive into our study, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Timmons, and the Knee Center. Yeah, I'm professor of economics here at St. Francis University. We're in Western PA, uh, just a short drive from West Virginia. I, I come down to Morgantown and, and Wheeling on occasion. Uh, so we, we have an academic center here at St. Francis. It's been around since 2016. And our main focus is the topic of the report. It's looking at occupational licensing. Here at the Nice Center, our mission is to inform citizens, policymakers, and other researchers about the extent, scope, and effects of occupational regulation. So any time we have an opportunity to serve as a resource on this very important topic, we're more than happy to jump at the opportunity. For those that don't already know, can you give a brief explanation of what occupational licensing is? Sure, so essentially what it boils down to is a system that's established where individuals that want to work in a particular profession have to obtain a permission slip from the government in order to work. And in order to get that permission slip, what individuals have to do is they have to pass a certain number of exams. They might have to pay some fees to the government to start the licensing process or to keep their license. They might have to complete continuing education requirements. Uh, it varies quite a bit from state to state as to what those requirements are. And over the last several decades, occupational licensing has spread in the percentage of workers that it affects. If we were to go back in time to the 1950s, it was only about 5% of workers that were directly affected by occupational licensing. Today, that number is more like one in five. So more than 20% of workers are directly affected by these laws, and that's double the percentage of workers that are affected by unionization and it's about eight or nine times the percentage of workers that are receiving the minimum wage so it matters a lot and it's affecting more and more workers and i think it's very important for states to carefully consider the costs and benefits of these regulations so you mentioned that back in the 50s, there were only about 5% of workers that were licensed, and today it's closer to something like one in five. How did these licensing systems develop historically? Do you think that this is just some part of like an anti-competitive system that's been growing, or what is the history behind the growth in occupational licensing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting history, and certainly the proponents of these laws make the argument that these laws are there to make sure that consumers are protected. And that's very important. I mean, we do want to make sure that consumers are receiving good quality service. But when you take a careful look and you think about who's advocating for these laws, it generally is professional associations. So it's not consumers like you and I, Amanda, mm -hmm. that are lobbying government bureaucrats to, you know, please license my barber because I got a, a bad haircut. And, uh, sure. you know, and you, you can look at my hairstyle and you, know, you might, might think that maybe we do <laughs> need to license my barber. I don't know. Um, but um, it, it's, it's instead, it's these professional associations that form and they're the loudest voice in the room. They're, they're always the ones who are advocating for these laws, pushing for these laws to be stricter, and you end up with a whole group of vested interests, whether it be schools like St. Francis University, barbering schools, beauty schools, that 
stand to benefit from keeping these laws in place. And it's not necessarily clear, even though they say it is, it's not necessarily clear that the health and safety of consumers is what's primarily driving their motivation. There, there's good economic arguments that can be made too, uh, namely that these professional associations and groups tend to benefit from these laws being in place. So with that as the backdrop of this study, you recently led the research team that performed the, the research for our new study, Barriers to Work in the Mountain State. Can you give just a brief overview of what the purpose and goal of this study was? Yeah, so what we were interested in doing was we were interested in comparing West Virginia to two of its neighbors. And we tried to take a conservative approach. I mean, we, we, we recognize that West Virginia does face economic challenges, and those challenges are not necessarily the same as those faced in Pennsylvania and Ohio, relatively speaking the average income in Pennsylvania and Ohio are quite a bit higher. So we figured that these would make sense as comparison groups to evaluate and very conservatively take a look at how licensing requirements compared in West Virginia in Ohio and Pennsylvania and trying to compare apples with apples. So looking at occupations specifically and comparing West Virginia to its more wealthy northern neighbors. So why did you decide to focus on Ohio and Pennsylvania, say, rather than Kentucky or Virginia? So we, we tried to err on the side of caution. We figured if we're comparing West Virginia to Kentucky, uh, not that the, the economic challenges are identical, but we figured by comparing West Virginia to Pennsylvania and Ohio, we take a much more conservative approach, particularly when we're thinking about fees. The standard or cost of living in Pennsylvania and Ohio are substantially higher than West Virginia. So if we see differences in Pennsylvania and Ohio relative to West Virginia, I think that's even more alarming. So we, we figured we take a more conservative approach with the analysis by comparing West Virginia to its northern neighbors. So let me make sure I understand. So you, your thought was that since Ohio and Pennsylvania have slightly higher costs of living, um, they might mm -hmm. have a higher average incomes. So if, for instance, their initial licensing fees were higher, it might be explained by that instead of an actual Exactly. Difference. Okay. Exactly. That's right. So this was just a way of making sure that any differences we see that look negative on West Virginia's side are actual differences and not that's just right differences. and uh, you know I, I think I think one differences that are even more worthy uh, to consider given the significant differences in the cost of living so we had previously our organization Cardinal had previously partnered with your team at the Nice Center earlier this year to do an initial study that looked at those full 64 occupations that you mentioned um, this study however zoomed in on the 25 that were deemed to be high barrier occupations in the original study. Can you explain a little bit more about how you determined if something was a high barrier occupation? Sure. So we took a look at some very specific occupational licensing requirements. We looked at initial licensing fees, so the fee that an aspiring barber or a massage therapist would have to pay in order to get the licensing process started. We looked at the renewal fees. We also looked at continuing education requirements, the number of exams, and whether or not the state had good moral character requirements. That was more a yes or no type of scenario. And with those five criteria, if the occupation in West Virginia was the highest so again, trying to be conservative here, so West Virginia was higher than both Pennsylvania and Ohio for three of the categories, we classified that as a high barrier. So that, that was the criteria we used. We checked to see how West Virginia, along these five different aspects or components of occupational licensing, compared to Pennsylvania and Ohio. And if West Virginia was higher than both in three or more of the categories, we classified it as high barrier. So this isn't just, you know, higher in one area or even half the areas. This is a predominant majority of the areas you looked at 
had to have been a higher barrier. That's right. That's exactly right. One of the potential barriers you mentioned was a good moral character requirement. Can you explain what that means? So some occupational licensing laws embedded into them, it it specifically uh, says in the statute that individuals have to possess good moral character or have to be of good moral character in in order to be eligible for licensing. Now, good moral character is quite subjective. It's a fuzzy uh, it's, term. <laughs> it's a very fuzzy term. So it gives a lot of leeway to the licensing boards in order to interpret what that means. This could mean any type of criminal conviction would exclude an individual from working in a particular occupation. So when we're thinking about criminal justice and we're thinking about how well our criminal justice system is working, in in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of a lot of other individuals, one of the best tools of rehabilitation is re-entering the workforce, successfully re-entering the workforce. And these occupational licensing laws could potentially be preventing individuals from doing so. They Uh, might be trained in prison as a barber and they might find that when they get out because of these good moral character clauses that they're not able to work as a barber and that just seems like we're spinning in circles and not uh, giving these uh, former uh, formerly incarcerated individuals an opportunity to re-enter civil society. So these good moral character clauses don't necessarily require that that good moral character have any correlation to the job that they're working. It could just be any sort of previous conviction or character flaw that the commission or board finds that may or may not be related to the work you're going to do. That's right. And that's that's an excellent point you raise. I mean, I I don't think that we'd want to have Bernie Madoff getting a CPA license (laughs) in West Virginia or any state. But I don't think there's anything stopping Bernie Madoff from being a barber. You know, his his crimes aren't related to his ability to perform as a barber. And I think th- there needs to be some consideration. And some states, thankfully, are, are beginning to acknowledge this and implement reforms that uh, make the change that you just suggested. Now, I want to take just a, a brief moment to step back and look at the occupations that were discussed in this study. And there was quite a range when I was reading through the study. Um, CPAs, certified public accountants, were one of the occupations you looked at. And then barbers, as well as barber teachers, were occupations that were looked at. Where did you, um, or how did you decide which occupations to look at? So we tried to give as an expansive list as possible. We wanted to make sure that we had some representation of lower income occupations, and also higher income occupations. Because I think when we're thinking about occupational licensing, it's important that we don't spend too much time thinking about low income occupations, you know, like uh, barbers and um, uh, hair braiders and and so forth. I, I think it's also important to consider how occupational licensing potentially presents challenges at the higher end of the spectrum as well. So we, we tried to, obviously, we couldn't look at every single occupation. We tried to have the best representation that we could, and also making sure that uh, we were able to obtain the data for our comparison states. That was another important criteria that we used in uh, choosing those occupations. When looking through the study, one of the things that you all also illustrated was that there are and correct me if I'm wrong, 38 boards and commissions in West Virginia Mm -hmm. that oversee these occupational licenses. Um, Who created these boards and commissions? Can you tell me a little bit about what they do? Um, Is there any overlap between them? So these these boards and commissions were uh, created by statute. And um, essentially what these boards and commissions do is they are the ones that are responsible for issuing licenses. These are the boards that are collecting the fees associated with licensing and all of the administration that uh, takes place in order to run the board. Um, what, What really struck us was we're looking at West Virginia 
which is a state that has a fraction of the population of Pennsylvania and Ohio, yet West Virginia had so many more licensing boards. As you mentioned, we, we found that West Virginia has 38 licensing boards. Ohio just has 21, and Pennsylvania only has 29. And the, the, these are states that have many more people. And it, it struck us that, you know, why... Why does West Virginia need all of these extra licensing boards? It, it, we, we had a hard time justifying, particularly given the difference in population uh, between West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania. That is an important question to ask. Why do we need so many? Wouldn't it, or at least to me, it would make more sense um, that this might be the sort of thing that could be centralized under one licensing office, or maybe just a few for different segments of the population? Um, as you mentioned earlier, one of the high barriers to entry for many of these occupations is the initial licensing fee. And as I yes. understand it, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that initial licensing fee, large portions of that is going to fund these commissions. That's right. So it's a little bit that's of a self-perpetuating system. Yes, that, that, that's absolutely right. And I mean, there, there were certainly some anomalies in West Virginia. One that, that really stuck out in my mind is that West Virginia has a separate licensing board for licensed practical nurses. Really? Um, just, I, I, I don't, just, just licensed practical nurses. So registered nurses have their own board and licensed practical nurses have a separate board. And I'm not sure if there's any other state, maybe one more, uh, but certainly Pennsylvania and Ohio uh, don't have a separate distinct board for licensed practical nurses. And this this is just one of many that, that, that we observed. That one really stuck out when I was uh, reviewing and taking a look at the data. Well, on that note of surprising findings in the study, what was the thing that stuck out the most to you or was most surprising that you discovered about West Virginia and its licensing regime while doing this study? Yeah, so in addition to the number of boards, I, I think that that was quite surprising to us when we, when we observed that. Another big surprise, and again, you know, given our conservative approach, the fact that we're comparing uh, West Virginia, which is not as well off as Pennsylvania or Ohio economically, we, for our uh, target uh, group of high barrier occupations, we regularly observe fees in West Virginia that were much higher. And uh, in particular, the renewal fees, uh, West Virginia's average renewal fees for the high barrier occupations was $259. And wow. that was more than $100 more than Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, so that, that was quite striking, particularly given the, the difference in cost of living between the two states. I mean, we we, we would have anticipated, and you know, again, thinking about this conservatively, we, we would have anticipated that Pennsylvania and Ohio had slightly higher fees. You know, so, so we were, they have a higher cost of living, that's what you would expect. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, we were deliberately trying to stack the deck against ourselves, uh, and yet we, we found this result that West Virginia had higher fees for these occupations, and not just a little bit, a lot higher. Uh, and, you know, if, if we really think occupational licensing is about health and health and safety, how do we justify these different differences in fees? I, I don't know how we, we begin to do so. Well, that's part of the question I wanted to ask. You just mentioned health and safety. And what we hear most often from people um, when discussing occupational licensing is that they would prefer to have a licensed barber or a licensed CPA or a licensed cosmetologist to do the work for health and safety reasons. And because they want to know that the person doing the job knows what they're doing. Um, of course, that you know makes intuitive sense. But why yep. can you explain to me um, you know, why that might not be the best argument for occupational licensing or um, what your answer would be to people who are like who think we should have these regulations just for health and safety reasons? Sure. So I, I think part of the challenge is, and you know, we're, we're working at the Nice Center to try and overcome this, this misunderstanding, but I, I think unfortunately there persists this misunderstanding about licensing versus regulation. And, and people equate the two. They, they, they assume that if, if we got rid of licensing of barbers, let's say, 
that all of a sudden we would have no regulation at all. That it would be the, the, the yeah, that's right. It'd be like the wild, wild West Virginia or wild, wild West uh, <laughs> of uh, barbering, and you know it, it would be just crazy out there. But in reality, uh, that wouldn't be the case at all. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, if if we were to go to um, the United Kingdom, right? Uh, it's not a backward country by any stretch of the imagination. It's a very wealthy European country. Yes. Barbers and cosmetologists are not licensed in the United Kingdom. I'm honestly instead, a little shocked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, instead they, they, they have a system of certification. And the, the way that it works is if I want to make sure that my barber or my cosmetologist met bare minimum qualifications, then I can just make sure that that barber's certified. Or I can make sure that that cosmetologist is certified from the professional beauty associations that exist in the United Kingdom. But the important thing is, is I have a choice. I have a choice as to whether or not I want to go to see that certified barber because for some consumers some consumers might say well you know i i don't necessarily think that's important i don't necessarily think that my cosmetologist or barber has to complete a thousand hours of education and jump through all the hoops to obtain a license i'm comfortable going to my barber my cosmetologist because i have a reputation or I have a I have a an experiment experience with this barber or cosmetologist. They have a reputation. I understand it, and I'm comfortable going to see that barber or cosmetologist. So certification is one of the many alternatives that are available to make sure that consumers are protected and consumers get good quality services. And there's a number of other ways you can have inspections. That's what we do in food services. So none of our uh, favorite chefs or uh, workers at restaurants that we like to go to, none of those folks have chefs a license. Aren't licensed. Yeah, and that seems a, a big, bigger health and safety risk to me. Food poisoning does than something like getting my hair cut. Absolutely, absolutely. And th there's another mechanism that we have in place. We have these random inspections that can be done at these establishments to make sure that they're meeting basic hygiene and, and basic food preparation and, and food quality control standards. And so, not to mention, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. I was going to say, so if I'm understanding you correctly with your example in the UK, um, mm -hmm. are you suggesting more private licensing or, well, certification boards? Yeah, and, and we, we do uh, private certification for mechanics here in the United States. Um, and again, I mean, they're uh, you know, the, the, the quality of the vehicle that we drive is, I think, probably more of a life or death situation than getting our hair cut and getting, getting our hair styled. Um, yet the, the, the private market seems to do a, a good job of indicating whether or not our mechanic is of good quality or not. When listening to your story of barbers in the UK, I was reminded that I, I'm actually going through a certification process myself. I'm working oh, okay. on being certified in project management. I know that's a, oh, lot yes. of a white collar, maybe than a mechanic job, but um, it's a professional job that needs you need to know that you can do it and do it well. And you're mm -hmm. taking care of people's projects, and they could have they could be low cost, but they could be high cost, and there could be a lot of risks. But there's Absolutely. an organization; it's the Project Management Institute. It's been around for decades, and they set the standards for such things. Um, there's a big 700 page textbook that you have to study and make sure you know what you're doing and yep. lots of exams, but it is a private thing that you can choose or not choose to do. And there's no yes. government organization overseeing it. And it seems they've been doing a pretty good job for the project management field for a long time. Yeah. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's a, a perfectly legitimate way to give information to consumers that want to make sure that the provider that they're working with has some bare minimum amount of experience and qualifications and so forth. Um, and not to mention uh, that there's also a wealth of information available online nowadays. I mean, when, when these laws were written, 
consumers didn't necessarily have access to the same information that they have it's access true. now. And uh, unfortunately, that there's no consideration of the fact that nowadays, if I'm interested in finding some information about a good barber, uh, I can simply go online. And th there's a wealth of information there. The internet and revolutionizes that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily clear that licensing suddenly eliminates bad providers either. You, you still need these other mechanisms in order to provide information. The, the fact that my barber's license doesn't really tell me anything. Uh, I'm much more interested in what sort of reputation does this barber have, what sort of reviews. I, I can talk to my friends and get some recommendations. I mean, that information to me is much more valuable than any piece of paper that uh, Charleston or Harrisburg or whatever state capital issues. Do you think so his, historically, there's been a pretty poor labor participation rate in West Virginia. Do you think that there's a relationship between this occupational licensing and that labor participation rate? I do. I mean, it makes good economic sense. And in fact, there was a study that came out, a very well done study by uh, Peter Blair at, at Harvard and, and Bobby Chung at the University of Illinois. And they looked at exactly this issue. They looked at how occupational licensing affects labor supply. So essentially folks' willingness to participate in the labor market. And they found evidence that occupational licensing reduces labor supply by anywhere from 17 to 27 percent. That's a large so amount. It's, yeah, it's quite significant. So, I mean, you know, we, 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 we understand that these occupational licensing laws are presented as a means a preserving public safety and improving the quality of service that we get. But what we fail to recognize, and us economists, we always want to think about benefits and costs. It's the way our, our mind works. But we, we want to think about the costs associated with these laws. And, and what these laws are doing, unfortunately, is they're preventing a lot of folks from entering the occupations that they would like to work in. And, you know, what we have to ask ourselves is, is, is it better for somebody to receive uh, some bare minimum quality of service and maybe everybody just gets that bare minimum quality of service because th there's arguments that can be made that licensing might also be a ceiling. Uh, but um, or do we want to have everybody having access to service? Uh, it's it's kind of like uh, Milton, Milton Friedman uh, talked about, uh, you know, sh should everybody be driving a Cadillac? Or is it okay for uh, everybody to have access to a whole host of different cars? And, and these are the types of questions we have to think carefully about when we're thinking about occupational licensing. There have been a lot of other states that have been tackling this issue outside of West Virginia. Um, states like Arizona come to mind for me. But when you mm -hmm. look at other states and the reforms they've been enacting in recent years, um, have you seen any maybe like gold standard reforms or um, reforms that you think we could implement here in West Virginia to improve our occupational licensing regime? Yeah, I think Arizona is definitely one that stands out for me. Uh, the, the fact that Arizona is now recognizing other states' licenses in most cases, I, I think that's a very important reform when you're thinking about folks that are moving into your state. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, it, it could very well be that uh, the, the status quo in West Virginia is preventing folks from working in the state. They move and the, they find that the transfer process is just too much to overcome. Um, I, I think uh, another regulate or another uh, piece of legislation uh, that I think is promising that, that, that hasn't moved forward yet in, in any state that I'm aware of is uh, the Occupational Licensing Consumer Choice Act. And um, essentially what this law would do is, and it can be tailored, I mean, I, I think there's good arguments that can be made that we wouldn't want to have this apply to health professions, but, and that can all be tailored. But essentially the, the crux of the argument is, is that this law, if passed, would convert occupational licensing to a system more like what we see in the United Kingdom for barbers and cosmetologists. If 
consumers wanted to make sure that their barber or you know whatever profession their massage therapist went through the licensing process they could still do that so it'll they, be an optional still, license that's exactly right that's exactly right so it moves it more towards that uh, optional certification uh, style rather than the the current status quo where either you go to a licensed professional or you, you don't go to anybody i can think of so many people that something like that would help especially um, with what Arizona is doing, providing for out-of-state licenses to be recognized. It's similar to reciprocity with any other kind of license, you know, your driver's license or like a concealed carry permit across states. There's this reciprocity yep. where states will recognize things. But I can think yep. of, you know, the first group that would really help is military families. Absolutely. My sister-in-law is a military spouse and she's um, an, a licensed um, physical therapy assistant. And so every time she moves states, she has to go through that process all over again. And it takes months sometimes after she's moved to be able to find a job. And I could see that being a real draw for people coming to West Virginia. We've had a bit of a population loss over the last several decades. So yes. giving people yes. reasons to move here um, could be a real boon for the labor force. Absolutely. And, and like you said, I mean, those costs are real. I mean, that's m months of lost income uh, that folks have to uh, deal with. And you're, you're absolutely spot on to, to speak about our military families. I mean, military families do tend to be quite a bit more mobile than the rest of the population. So disproportionately, uh, occupational licensing can have these negative consequences for military families because they're asked to move so often. And they might find that thankfully more and more states are addressing this issue, uh, but it remains and persists as an issue in a number of states. Well, I have one final question for you before I let you go and get back to your teaching schedule. What do you think is the most important takeaway from this study for West Virginians? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what what we were hoping to uh, to what we were hoping to accomplish with this study is merely shedding a light on. I, I think too, for, for for far too long in in too many states, there's just been a lack of awareness about. No how occupational, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that, that's exactly what we're trying to do at the Knee Center. We, we want to make sure, we, we don't want to tell policymakers what to do. We don't want to tell people what to think. We just want to give them the information and, and let them make up their own mind. But you, you, can't, you can't make an informed choice if you don't have the data in front of you. So we, all that we're merely trying to do is shed some light on what's going on with occupational licensing in West Virginia relative to these other two states. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Timmons. We've really appreciated your work on this study, and we look forward to seeing further work from the Knee Center. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too.